Yo, what's up? It's your boy Walter Emanuel Jones, also known as Zach, the original Black Ranger. Hey! <laughs> Yo, check it out. Just gotta give a shout out to my boy. You know what time it is? It's time for the fan club. Let's go! Hey! I can't do this on my own, cause you know things ain't always sweet when you out here in these streets. But my morpher went in morph. I made a fake. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get to our panel. Let's, let's go ahead and introduce, first of all, the man, man myth, the legend, the guy right here. It's, it's Mr. Tom Rupert, the creator of Animaniacs. Let's bring him off the stage. Tom Rupert! Tom, Tom, hey, what was your question? I told you not that day. Comedic moment! Okay, here we go. Comedic. Oh, my, my, my. And then next one, we have, of course, he's a writer. He, he is. He's, he's a writer. writer. He is a voice actor. He's, he's a, a puppeteer. puppeteer. And he's also one of the funniest men I know on the planet. It's Mr. Paul Rudd. Oh, oh, my God. I even have a fake hip. <laughs> well, welcome everybody to the Animaniacs 30th anniversary panel. It's the 30th anniversary of Animaniacs. We couldn't be more excited to be here. And I think we'll be, I hope, because honestly, I have not even checked for sound on this su sucker. But uh, if everything works as planned, we should have sound. Let me just double click, click right now. Let's see. Uh, let's see if we have sound. No, we don't have sound. <laughs> do it. We'll just do it. Well, so, yeah, say, do anybody do, 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 do you know any of you know the Animax theme song? I would hope so. Those who know it. Those who know it. The good one. Which version does Dot say in the last line? So that will go with Here's the Show's Name. Yes. And those who know it, sing it loudly for the others to cover them up. Are we ready? I think you're going to leave with a pretty voice. I can see. You can. We, we, we have 80 people helping out as well. You know, yeah. That's David. David, a very talented voice actor. David, David. Mr. Burr. Burr from Phineas and Burr. He's all, he's all, he's so talented. He's also in his booth later, so run over now. Yes. Here we go. Ready? And go. And look. It's time for Animaniacs. And we're taking to the mats. So just sit back and relax. They lock us in the tower whenever we get caught. Then we make loose and bend mammoths, and now you know the lot. But we're an animaniac. Oh boy, got a tune and yak, oh yes. Welcome back to my ex. Welcome to my ex. We're an animaniac. Me, Pinky, and the brain who want to rule the universe. Good feathers walk together, sloppy wax and with a purse. Cool. Button chases Pinky, glorious things at first. The writers that we have no script, why bother? No rehearsal, we're changing our Let's give it up for that. This, and by the way, all the lyrics for that written by this gentleman right here, wow. Mr. Tom Ruger. Yeah. Uh, so get your voices ready since we none no, of the clips will have sound. sound. Yeah, you know we're, we're gonna, gonna have to have you guys fill in all the sound. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'll, I'll tell a little story, and we want your questions. So please have your questions ready. Uh, the, the show, uh, we developed the show uh, a couple years ahead of 1993 when it premiered, and uh, we had made Tiny Tunes and that was a hit, so Mr. Spielberg and Warner Brothers, uh, they, they came to me and they said, what do you want to do next? And Steven said, maybe you should do the, the Pucky Duck show. And I said, oh no, we're done. We're done with Tiny Tunes. We can't do any more. We'll, we'll die. So, <laughs> so I said, we have some other ideas. So. Uh, on a Saturday morning, uh, I mentioned this a few ago already. On uh, Saturday morning, I went to Mr. Stiller's house with Dean McCurdy, uh, my, my boss, and Sherry Turner, and uh, we had milk and cookies, which we thought, well, no cereal, and it seemed like, 
just being grateful for the milk and cookies. And uh, we pitched the show to him. Uh, we pitched uh, different segments of the show that, that came to be Animaniacs. And we had stand-ups like this tall of the different characters. And I, I, uh, I had the, the Pink in the Brain theme song already written, the words to it. And, and, uh, and he liked the idea of Pink in the Brain, but he said, oh, let me hear the theme song. So I had written it to uh, Singing in the Rain. Which, so all the words to the Peter the Brain theme song, if you know those words, you'll, you'll realize that, yes, it totally fits with Singing in the Rain, because we're pinky and the brain, they're pinky and the brain. One is a genius, the other's insane. They're loud, they're mice, they're genius and spice. They're dinky, they're pinky and the brain. And, and Steve <laughs> and, 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 uh, Steven said, sold! And, and so we had a bunch of different uh, segments we were, we were uh, pitching, and he, he said he didn't want to do many, but uh, we have enough parrots, we have read it and run, we have pink in the brain, let's not do many and buttons. And then uh, Kate Capshaw and their batch of kids, they had a bunch of kids, uh, and they were all pretty young. One was like a two-year-old toddler, and he came toddling in, and he walked up to the little Mindy stand-up, cute little Mindy, and he said, I like her. And, and Stephen said, Mindy and Buttons are back in. <laughs> and that's how they, uh, they made it into the show. Uh, Mr. Rugg, tell, tell something interesting. Oh, dear. Uh, uh, oh, so, well, what would you guys like to know? Oh, I'll tell you. Um, I'm sorry, it's been a long time. Uh, when I had never written animation in my life, I was doing a sketch comedy. I was doing, um, I was doing a, a sketch comedy show at the Acme Comedy Theater when Tom and Sherry Stoner, who by the way, Sherry Stoner is one of, the, one of our, our uh, story editors and also the model from Ariel in Little Mermaid. The original? I don't know. Yes. Uh, so they were looking for someone to sort of do that sort of... Um, uh, Marx Brothers writing and stuff. So that, this was my, literally my first, my first job, and uh, it's been my, the most fun I've, I've, I've ever had. But what what we did was we basically did the Marx Brothers. Um, you have Yakko who was Groucho, Wacko who was uh, Harpo, Harpo, and Doc who was Chico. Chico, Chico. sure <laughs> or not. Uh, and but we, so we really try to keep that energy to it and. Um, so if you're if you're kind of wondering, so that's where we started. But as we as we continued writing, it started the Marx Brothers, but then they sort of came into their came, came into their own. Um, and it was I have to tell you, it was the most fun we sort of ever had because normally now when you show there are notes from a million different people, all we had to uh, please in writing. And we wrote along, we did the writer's group, it was Tom Brewer and Stephen Spielberg. And if Stephen Spielberg was somewhere liked it, and if someone else came in and said, I think you should check that out, I'd go, Stephen liked it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, then just continue on with it. Um, and he, he was a great boss to have. He loved the show, um, and he sometimes would add things to it that I didn't always understand, but it was always fun. Um, anyway, that's all I have to, that's all I have to say, but I think we should hit from you people. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. In fact, I have the microphone right here, so what I'll do, I think, is I can go out into the crowd. That's crazy. That is insanity. <laughs> well, I want to tell a story about Paul Rock. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just for a second. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Einstein created the theory of relativity, and I have no idea if this is related to it, but E equals MT squared has something to do with that. Yes. E equals MT squared. So, so Paul Rudd wrote this cartoon that's called Cookies for Einstein. Einstein. And, and the Warner Brothers, Brothers are, in what town were they in? Uh, they were in Bern, Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> and so they were selling, uh, like, Boy Scout cookies or, uh, anyway, they were going door to door, and they, they bothered Mr. Einstein, who was trying to do his work on his equation, the equation squared, and that sort of thing. And uh, so Paul Rudd is trying to come up with the ending of this cartoon, and Paul is nothing if not... Uh, a tortured, tortured artist. <laughs> <laughs> he really, you know, he really cares. He's really funny. He's really and so he's so funny that he keeps his uh, standards. Like he doesn't want to turn in a script that he thinks is in gold. And so, you know, he does torture himself on that. But uh, this is going to be real hard for all of you to see. But uh, 
So, he came in and he finally said, I had a cartoon epiphany. And would you, would you like to explain, explain what that means? Yes. So, uh, I was trying to figure out how, uh, how I could get to an E equals MC squared. I mean, so basically, the idea is that the Warner Brothers give Albert Einstein the theory of relativity, E equals MC squared. I'm like, how am I ever going to get there? Uh, then, Acme, well, Acme is a Warner Brothers trope. It's the company that everything comes from. And the kids were selling Acme uh, Kid Scout cookies. Uh, so, so what I did was, it, it occurred, occurred to me one day, this is my wife actually, um, Acme, if you put Acme backwards, uh, it's E equals MC squared. Um, and I was like, and I ran into Tom and I go, I figured it out. <laughs> and this is like after, normally Tom would give us a week to write a script, but this one was going on like two weeks, and I was like, I don't know! So, I was very excited. Well, it, it really, it, that to me, I, I don't know how, you do that. I think that's just genius. <laughs> that too <laughs> turned into the day of acting. It's great. Anyway, uh, let's, let's see. What are some other things we should tell you about? Uh, uh, Stephen didn't want to make the show unless he had a marquee name. Um, I had my own cartoon at Disney one day, so he wanted a marquee name. I said, You're the marquee name, Mr. Spielberg. And uh, he said, No, no, no. I'm talking about, you know, like the name of the title, like the, you know, Plucky Duck? No, no, no. Okay. So I'm walking across the lot uh, after a meeting, and I see the water tower. And on the water tower, of course, is that big shield the w, the, that has WB on it, which is sort of the Warren Brothers marquee. And I had my cartridge on Epiphany where, wait, I don't know if we could do this, but we could name these characters the Warner Brothers. That could be their house, basically, up there. Uh, the WB is a symbol for them. And, uh, that's kind of a marquee name. So uh, I called Mr. Spielberg, and you know, I had some art, and I had them peeking out of the shield, and he, uh, he, he went for it. So that's how they wound up living in the water tower and being the, uh, some of to do with why they're the lunatics that they are. <laughs> <laughs> and these are all uh, pencil tests from before the show went on the air. And all of those things are uh, very early pencil tests by Rich Aarons and the entire uh, animation staff of the studio. All done, uh, almost all done in right, right in LA. Yeah, yeah you, you can see, see some of the looks, uh, like, like this is before, before they had whiskers on, on their cheeks and everything, oh, yeah. right? Can yeah, you tell us a little bit about that well, whole uh, Well, that uh, Paul Rudd got a picture of this thing that was on a tower. Yeah. 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 Oh, I don't know, where, where did the balloon come, come from? So we, uh, for our premiere, Gene McCurdy, who's the best boss in the world, she was president of Warner Brothers Animation, we thought, wouldn't it be funny if there were huge balloons that went to the top of the Warner Brothers uh, Tower, and it was Yak the Wacko Dot, and that's what we did. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars we spent to make these big balloons, and on our premiere day, Yak the Wacko Dot were on the actual uh, Warner Brothers Tower. Anyway, uh, it just so happens that, was it the president of Warner Brothers? Yeah, Bob Daly, who ran the studio. President of Warner Brothers, uh, who I guess didn't really know what anyone was doing, uh, he wanted to know why Mickey Mouse was on the water. <laughs> and we were like, wait, I'm sorry, what? And, uh, and then he's like, yeah, but Mickey Mouse is on the water tower! Two of them, and one of them looks really weird. Uh, and, uh, and we're like, get them down! As soon as they went up, the uh, they were taken down, and I think now they're permanent. Man, so yeah, they, they said they were they appeared about 10, 15 years later at a Burning Man festival. Yeah. Of all things, Yakko, Yakko, and Dot and Inflatables. So somebody say, who knows where they are these days? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if they burned up. And, and, uh, they called us into the front office. You said, don't want that when they call you in the yeah, phone. Yeah, who, who, who is, uh, what is this thing? And, and we've been making this for a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> and, he said, and he literally, uh, he said, bring in the model sheets. And he was concerned that it looked too much like a Mickey Mouse. So uh, on that day, Bob Daly took a pencil on the drawing of the Yakko. And said, if we put whiskers right here on the edge of his cheek there, which is not... Oh, no, they didn't uh, do the yeah. uh, And we put that, that will satisfy me. So uh, at that moment, um, we, we sent all the Orchard Studios, and they were all... They spent the next month putting whiskers on every drawing they ever made of the characters. <laughs> and if you look carefully on some... I think on uh, the first episode of The Mr. Director, there's a couple shots where you can still see Yakko without the whiskers. So there's a, there's a few... They're very adorable without the whiskers. 
Uh, um, early on in the process with uh, working with Mr. Spielberg on the Tiny Toons and the Animaniacs, uh, uh, the same fine, and he's a great guy, Bob Daly, uh, but he ran the studio pretty carefully. And he called me in, and along with Gene McCurdy of Boston, and said, uh, now, do you know uh, what will be the sign that you have succeeded? Uh, what, what, your, what your job here is in, 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 in working on these cartoons? What do you think that is? And Gene McCurdy, I think it was, just to make the best dark cartoons on earth, right? He said, no. No. <laughs> That's not really what, what your job is. What, what is uh, to get great ratings. No, 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 not, not that. Uh, how about uh, to get, uh, am I, I'm beeping. I'm sorry. My wife. Uh, uh, to uh, just, uh, to get, maybe to win awards. No, no. Your job on making these cartoons is to please Steven Spielberg. We want to be in business with Mr. Spielberg. We want him to like working with Warner Bros. So that he'll make some of his, you know, billion dollar box office movies with us. And uh, so, if he's happy with you, then that's a good step. But if he is ever unhappy with you, you are out of here. And uh, so, we, that was our job, keep Stephen happy. And then he became DreamWorks, so no big deal. <laughs> Do, Do any of you folks out there have some questions for either Tom or Paul about Animaniacs? I will rush off to you. Here we go. Here Don't we rush go. too quickly and fall. Oh, oh. Now you're sure. sure. <laughs> hi, Paul. Hi, Tom. Nice to see you again. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a wonderful shirt. shirt. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. You sold it. Thank sorry. you. <laughs> I love, also love the talk uh, that we had yesterday. Uh, so one of my questions is, and I have several, so I got it. So I got to make sure everyone, I got to make sure I give everyone the time. Yes. So yeah. how much of the script writing was telling the voice actors and the animators to do this, and how much of it was just, okay, we kind of like that mistake. Let's put that in, like improvised. Uh, so, um, a lot, it, it was pretty much, it was written, so and there was not a lot of, um, of, of going off script. Uh, the words we wrote were pretty much the words in the, in the, in the script, uh, or the words that, that they said. Uh, there, is, there was improvisation in sort of a stylistic kind of way to do things. Like, when Rob would go, I don't know, you know, that sort of, and that, that came from him. And then we're like, okay, great. So it both sort of influenced each other, um, but I'm a dreadful writer insofar as you would say it was, I would like it. You know what I mean? I mean, like, I, and, and that's how Tom was too. But if things happened, we would put it, put it in. But uh, we pretty much, um, yeah, we yeah. did it. There's there's, there's a there's, there's a kind, kind of melody to the dialogue. I mean, that sounds corny, but I mean, a, a, a joke well told will often have very specific words to pay off. Um, also, just about the writing, um, people say, "Well, what was the writing room like?" And just for your, and, and writing rooms, I, I think you're all familiar with it. They talk about it a lot. Uh, that, that a lot of shows nowadays are made with you know 12 people in a room and they break the script down and they figure it all out and then, uh, and then they do the next one. Well, uh, tell them about our right, writing room, Paul. Uh, we didn't have one. Ah, uh, basically. Uh, we would, uh, there were, uh, yeah, I don't know, Peter Hastings, Sherry Stoner, John McCann, Raymond Rogel, uh, and Nicholas Hollander. We were just going to Tom's office and he'd say, what do you got? And I'd go, well, I think I want to have uh, the Warners to go after Einstein. Great. Bye. <laughs> That's fine. Just, Just bring it back, back and we can have for your fire. No. Uh, <laughs> but, but normally, so let me tell you the way it's done these days. It's, it's like, what would you like to write? I don't know. I'd like them to write and go to Einstein. Great. Put that in a little paragraph. And then you put it in a little paragraph. And then, great. From here, put it in a longer paragraph. And it kills everything. The way we wrote it was, we'd go in, we'd tell Tom what we're going to do. We'd have a looking at we'd come back, and here's the script. And then he'd go, I would change this, 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 and this. Um, 
It's, it's not, not the way it's done today, but it was, if you like it, if you like freakazoid, if you like freaking the brain, if you like all that sad stuff, there was a freedom to it. Um, of course, we would go into each in everybody's room and say, hey, you know, uh, let's, uh, can you help me with this joke? And one of the biggest examples was when Peter Hastings came into, I think it was John McCann, and, and I was standing there, and he goes, I'm trying to think about this joke for Pinky in the Brain, where the brain says, what are we doing tonight? Uh, no, he goes, uh, are you thinking what I'm, are you pondering what I'm pondering? Oh, Brian, we're going to duck the hose in this out, right? We're going to duck the um, And that was just Peter riffing in the room and stuff. So sometimes that would happen. But basically, no writer's room, they're very bad. <laughs> Don't like them. Another question right over here. Hello, Tom. Hey, Tom, it's you again. Also, Paul, thank you for signing my MA Act again. You're welcome. And what was your all time favorite song in any of the MA Acts? Like, any, like, just main theme song or one of the other shows? I'll have several. I'm going to give you a few. But I'm going to start with, I would say, I think the most meaningful and heartwarming and popular song from the whole series. And here to perform with that now. Mr. Paul Rowe. I think I know what you're talking about. This one really it touches me deeply. <clears throat> when the whip a will, whip is in the wind, the wind can't whip it back. Oh, nice and chubby, baby. That Home, you're gonna love it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, we had, uh, who, who voiced uh, chairman of the board? Who, who that was Ben Stein. Ben Stein. I don't know if you guys are familiar with, uh, he's, he's one, one of the famous, famous most boring people, people on earth. earth. <laughs> he, was a, he was a teacher in Ferris Bueller, who was like, Bueller, 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 and he wasn't present. Uh, Peter Hastings made uh, this, he really did, I was personally made in this entire little cartoon at the very beginning of one of our episodes. It was only it was like two, three minutes, and it was a perfect parody of The Lion King, which was uh, the, the music with the, all the animals going across the tundra, and then uh, the lion cub being raised by the, 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 the monkey, and the, the song is just tremendous. The tiger prince. The tiger prince. And, uh, and Yak goes to the guy holding up the, the little uh, tiger, yeah. with us, and he, he, he drops, and he goes like, oh. And he said, like, oh. like, oh. I thought they were supposed to land on her feet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we had fun stuff. We had, uh, they, they visited the devil in the cartoon that the Warner Brothers did. They, uh, uh, they, they met death, which is not a common theme in, in kid cartoons. And uh, they played chess with their checkers, I believe. Uh, I also love uh, a cartoon that shows sure. sure. Bumby's mom, which uh, was uh, uh, Bambi. It was basically Bambi, and, and Skippy and Slappy are in the audience, and, and it's just a blissful thing with Slappy feeling like she's a good aunt taking her nephew to see this wonderful movie, Bumby. And then Bumby's mom gets shot, and <laughs> Skippy just turns into a crying machine. <laughs> <laughs> and so cartoons are different in real life, though. So Slappy takes Skippy to a uh, town in, in like Arizona uh, and has Skippy meet uh, uh, the, the actress who played Bumby's mom. Uh, I think her name was Bina Waleen. She was a, a, a deer, and she. There it is. Oh, <laughs> Any more questions? I have, so I have a question over here. Oh, yeah. Waiting yes. very patiently. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm talking too much. Uh, thank you. Um, I was curious when you were doing the show if you ever got any feedback from Jerry Lewis or his attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think we ever did. Did, did we, we ever? Did we ever? No, we got, we got, a, uh, we did a, a Noah's Lark. We did, did a, we did a Noah's Lark cartoon. We did get letters from Richard Lewis's attorneys. Richard Lewis uh, is another comedian, and we had him not only uh, playing the role of Noah, and uh, in other words, someone doing a voice like Richard Lewis, and the caricature of Noah is the character of Richard Lewis. The mistake was we also had him doing Richard Lewis's material. <laughs> So that's, that's, that's the, the, the perfect, perfect uh, the, the trip tick, that's, yeah. you can't do all three. They said, no, please don't do that again. Uh, and we had, uh, the only other letter uh, I recall that was uh, questioning, and none of them resulted in lawsuits, thank God. So the other one was, uh, at the very beginning of Woodstock Slappy, uh, we did like, we're going out of the country, you got to get away, going out of the country. We did something like that. Is that the band? Who was that? In which time? Anyway, uh, we got we got a, a letter about that. It was a little too close. <laughs> and of course, I think you should tell people about the monkey song right at the right the first episode. Right, the first episode of Animaniacs was desanitized. Something Paul wrote that's, that really sets up the relationship between the Warners and Dr. Scratch and Sniff, and really funny cartoon. And we followed that with the monkey song, which was had everybody in the cast done uh, singing and, and moving around during a performance of uh, a parody of Harry Belafonte's uh, monkey song, which is uh, nothing in the world the monkey won't do. You know, one Monday morning I woke up late, there was a monkey outside the gate, and so this monkey torments Harry Belafonte. So we took it and. Uh, and I went to the legal department and months before I said, we're, we're doing this. And they researched it and it said, uh, you know, traditional 
So they said, traditional, that's got to be public domain. Go, go for it. Just do it. <laughs> and so, uh, so we did, uh, nothing in the world the monkeys won't do. And the, the Warners were playing the monkeys, and they were trying many scratches and other characters. So uh, uh, the Friday before we went on the air, uh, the legal department calls and says, hey, did we clear this? <laughs> and I said, I said, well, you said it was traditional, we're good, and we're gonna, yeah, we did say that, but it turned out Harry Belafonte wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that would mean traditional would be something from like 1880. Uh, uh, Harry Belafonte wrote it, it's probably uh, copyrighted. Anyway, so the legal department was on the phone all weekend with Harry Belafonte's people, and so that we could air the show on Monday, and it, it worked out, luckily. Yeah, just barely. We have a question over here from a younger fan right over here. Who plays um, Dot's voice? That would be Tracy McNeil, uh, who's an amazing voice actress, and she's amazing. She can do like all kinds of things. She can do old ladies, and she can do young kids, and she's amazing. Hey, do you, uh, have you ever watch uh, Mickey's Clubhouse? Mickey's, Mickey's Clubhouse. Uh, she does Daisy, Daisy Duck's voice as well on that. Uh, and she does, uh, she's a regular on The Simpsons. She does voices every week on The Simpsons, and she's very wealthy now. Yes. <laughs> she even did a character in Nickelodeon's Avatar Last Airbender. Yeah. Out of all the ideas you've had, uh, besides the whiskers, um, What's the smallest change or the smallest idea you had that meant the most to you for the Animaniacs? That meant, that meant the, the most. most. Uh, gee, the, the change that meant the most. I don't know. Uh, getting, getting a raise? raise? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really small. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I, 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 I don't know. Well, this, this is, this was, was a, uh, it, this, this was, was a minor change. change. It didn't mean a lot to me, but it, uh, we made some cartoons with Minerva Mink, and uh, there was a point where uh, the cartoons, so we had a great company in Chicago making some of our cartoons. They did a lot of the best slappy squirrel cartoons, and it was named Star Tunes. And so they made a Minerva Mink cartoon, and she had a whole lot of cleavage. She, had, she was very zostic. Is that the word? Sure. And, uh, <laughs> and she was very Marilyn Monroe-like, and so, but she had this line, a line there. So she had a dress up, and there was a line there that indicated a lot of cleavage, and uh, Gina McCurdy McC really objected to it. So we had cartoons go back onto the cell, so we already shot the show, we already put it on the air. And, and they went and they scraped off the, the, uh, the Xerox ink lines for some of those extra cleavage shots. And now you know. <laughs> See, today, today we would, they would do it uh, on the computer. It'd be easy to get rid of it. But we, had to, we were still making it camera and cell. All right, so we saw some of your favorite uh, episodes. Were there any of like the smaller uh, side characters that you wanted to do more of, or that you really liked like hmm. doing those? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> there was a character I wrote uh, once, and he never got to see him again, called Charlie Woodchuck. Um, and Charlie. And he, and he turned his head like this, and it was Jeff Bennett doing an impression of Truman Capote. Uh, and it was about, it was about a, 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 a woodchuck who wants to be famous in Hollywood, but he doesn't have the talent for it. And he's in like a, a Disney, he's going to be been cast in a Disney nature film, and he basically gets like a crappy bad one. Um, and, and, well, that woodchuck. Yeah, and Frank Welker did the best Rex Allen. You guys probably don't know, but Disney needs to do the nature documentaries. You know, Charlie loves some cougar. Maybe that bear again. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it was just Charlton just literally getting mauled by a bear repeatedly. Um, and it brought me great delight. Uh, it's a great big universe, and we're all really puny. We're just tiny little specks about the size of Mickey Rooney. Exactly. <laughs> it's, but it still holds up today. Um, but I saw, like, the Les Mis one in there, because I was thinking about that earlier, too, and I just 
wondered if you could just talk a little bit about your influence because the Gilbert Sullivan's done that, that was brilliant. Um, well, Lame is, is, is so. the, the Lame Lame is animals. Oh, Rita and Ron. Of course, you have Rita, uh, Bernadette Peters singing for Rita, so you're in really good hands. It was written by Deanna Oliver. I think it's uh, the best of all the Rita and Ron cartoons. Uh, it's beautifully done. Uh, it, it, and the songs are hilarious. And the interesting thing is, the, Deanna Oliver wrote it. She had never, ever seen Les Mis in her life. <laughs> so that's how smart and talented she is. By the way, that was really brilliant. And you got Bernadette Peters. That's like. I know. Bernadette Peters. Yeah. You can't go wrong. <laughs> well, uh, that's all the time we have for today. But thank you so much, Jamal. You've been so fantastic. Thank you for having us over. And we'll see you downstairs. I want to give a very special shout out to the Gold Ranger members, Anime King Nick, Chaos Draco, The Arctic Operator, Thomas Franco, Tim Rage, Dig Wyron, Roderick Hare, Miguel Ortiz, The Voiceless One, Let's Talk Sports, Dead Echo X-Ray, Papillon Oger, Roderick Ham, Jason Morazes, Austin White, Willie Maloney, Lewis Cairns, and Bruce Walters. Thank you guys so much for the support. If you guys want a video shout out like this one, sign up to be a Gold Ranger member today. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this content, you know what to do. Hit that like, hit that subscribe button, and hit that notification bell. You can also become a member. Please join the fan club support team right now. We have a Blue Ranger power up and a Gold Ranger power up. This is an awesome way to talk with the fans, join a fan club official chat group. You can also be featured in our videos. At the end of the videos, I will shout you out. That's if you get the Gold Ranger Power Up membership. Go check it out. Go support the fan club. We love you guys, and thanks for watching. Peace.